I came on that trip and I didn't enjoy it. If it was me, I'd go straight to the organiser because I'd want to sort my problem out. So, I'm Jay and I run a company called The Cannon Run. Everybody is responsible for their own vehicle, their own driving. I do say to everybody, if you're going to put people at risk, get off of our event. Keep the class to keep that vibe going. Jay Cannon owns a football club, Chorley FC, and you've just bought a drinks company. We're doing 12, 14 hour days at the minute, seven days a week between the two of us. James rang me and went, listen, I've had a phone call. We can buy Chorley Football Club now. I don't even understand what offside means. <laughs> <laughs> and if you go on Google, type in Chorley Football Club. We have been on every single major news platform in the UK and Europe in the last four days. Are you ever satisfied? No. I, I, no, no, that's wrong of me to say that. Jay, it's been a long time coming, but we're finally sat here together in the van. I think we spoke about doing a podcast right at the beginning when I first started it. And it's mad how weeks turn into months and stuff just ends up snowballing. We bumped into each other at Autosport earlier in the year. Many will be familiar with your brand. I think if you, anybody's been to a major car show in the UK, they will already know who you are and what you do. However, Jay, in your own words... Who are you and what do you do? Okay, so I'm Jay and I run a company called The Cannon Run. And The Cannon Run is basically a driving holiday company that puts on a package holiday like Thomas Cook would for you sort of normal guys that aren't into cars, including all the hotels and the nightlife and the activities along the way. That's basically what we do for supercar drivers. Now, my podcast is called Road to Success. Sat here today opposite me, I've seen you own some amazing cars purchase various businesses and do things that many would look up and want to do. So I want to understand how you've got to the point of owning one of the most recognised brands in terms of motoring holidays across Europe and also address maybe some other people's perceptions of the brand from different areas of motoring and we'll get into that. But what I want to know to understand you a little bit more is if you could pick one key moment from your upbringing that you think was the most profound that set you on this journey what do you think it would be? In terms of setting me on the journey of motorsport, motoring cars, that would be down to my dad because my dad was a huge petrol head when I was a kid, so it was bred into me. Like when I was six, seven, he had Sierra Cosworths, Escort Cosworths, then on to like Lotus Carlton's, Toyota Supras, that sort of stuff, but never supercars, always that kind of level. Business side of it, um, I live with my nan and granddad since I was 18 months old. And my nan's very much a boss in her own right. She still drives around in a Range Rover Sport now. She's still a landlady. And I always remember her having her desk all set up in the office. And I thought that was the coolest thing in the world was having a desk and working. So I had my little desk set up next to her on the floor and my little chair and little notepad. And, you know, I thought I was doing my own little business in my head at that age. So it was very influ influential and from my nan and my dad. Do so you reckon you got the business side from your grandparents and your nan? Also my dad as well, but I spent more time around the business at home when I was young with my nan and granddad. And my dad was always away working. Um, but then the cars, yeah, from my dad. So where is home? Where obviously today we're down in Kent. Is this always where you've been brought up? No. You've gone to places all over the country in Europe, but where were you born and bred? So I was... I was born in a place called Shrewsbury and I grew up in Ironbridge in Telford, which is Shropshire. Um, lived there all my life, still got a base there today. I think I'll always have a base there. Um, and that's where I went to school and my sort of friendship group is from. But I'm sure as you probably will know this as well, as you grow older and you grow away from people, your friendship group kind of spreads to different areas. So that doesn't really go into play much more if you're not your typical nine to five guy, I suppose. See. So the guy that I see sat opposite when I've been on the Cannon Run or I've seen you on a stand at a show, wherever, you are what I would describe as a social butterfly. There's almost like a queue of people queuing up for their slot to chat to you because you just have built this network where you know everybody and anybody and you're always up for having a laugh and there's always a lot of banter going around and all the rest of it. Was that exactly the same as how you were growing up as a kid at school? Yeah. Not... Not queues of people waiting to see me and waiting to speak to me about, about business or anything because obviously I was young then and I had no value really because I was learning and I was in school but I was always kind of getting in trouble with the teachers for being too noisy or too much banter in class or having a laugh too much or whatever. I was never a naughty kid in terms of fighting or getting expelled from school but there was always like a little mark on my report for being the class clown or something like that. So You got to the point where you were nearly kicked out the lesson yeah. but not quite And then basically. wind my neck back in, yeah. That's it, yeah. That's it. <laughs> what... What is your earliest memory of going on a trip? 
a road trip. A, a group of people going on a trip, whether it be a road trip or something. I can't tell you exactly. You remember going away. So Modball, 2009, um, I booked. I was 18 and I had an E46 M3 cab and me and my pal went and did it. And it was still to this week, still to this day, sorry, the best week of my life. But because I was very, very uneducated, I hadn't seen Europe, I hadn't travelled abroad, I hadn't driven abroad, so everything was new to me. It was like, why, 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 why? But the organisation side of that trip wasn't great and there wasn't much support in terms of the after sale. So all there before the ticket was purchased and, you know, phone calls, emails, all the rest of it. But then once the ticket had been purchased and you were on the trip, it was kind of like there was not really any love and you know yourself through doing business. The after sale is just as important as the sale itself because you return customers your easiest business. So was that also the moment that you decided to set up your own rally? No. So I went away, carried on working for a bit, and then about a year later I thought, I'm going to go back and do it again because I loved it. I went back, had an accident, had a head-on crash, um, and organised didn't answer his phone, no one to help. Um, very young, very scared in a foreign country, you know, with a written-off car, not being able to get anywhere, and... I'll always remember this day, there was two lads in a Sierra Cosworth, a Sapphire four-door, and they stopped, they were on the trip. It was a car that hit me head on, and he was on the wrong side of the road. So um, they stopped, they put their luggage on the roof with bungee cords, put all of our luggage in the boot, put us in the back. This car was scraping, four-door Sierra, like literally scraping on the floor, and he took me to the hotel. And um, that's why I implemented 24-hour recovery on our events, which leave last every day. When you came, this wasn't something that we had funding to be able to do five years later or however long it's been since you came. Obviously, things are different now. We also have Craig and Vicky on the trips who are active paramedics in the Liverpool Ambulance Service who are in a response vehicle. So um, we had a really bad accident on Mega Run last year in terms of um, the damage to the vehicle. The guy had a blowout. He was on a um, very fast bit of motorway and... The car lost control, hit centre reservation and split into two pieces. The engine went that way and the front of the car went that way and they got out with their sandals on like, well, that's cool. And I was like, oh, never mind, we won't even get into that. So um, the guys went and hired a car, by the way, and carried on. It was brilliant. But our uh, recovery truck was on scene within something like genuinely 14 minutes. It was something ridiculous because it always leaves last. So theoretically, it's always behind you if there's a problem. And the paramedics were on scene a minute or thereabouts before the recovery truck. And the police got there the car was on the back of our truck. He was sat on the side of the road being examined by paramedics, but they were obviously British paramedics. And the police actually, when they pulled up, they couldn't believe that this rally, which they always experience rallies coming through France because it's the gateway to Europe, had actually achieved to tidy up this mess, treat the people who were driving the car and have some form of organisation around this specific side of their events because there is no one else that does that. And there might be new guys popping up who are trying to offer the same services as us because they think they need to kind of match what we offer. But there's no one that's that you would know that is a rally company that offers what we do. Sure, you know it's um, mad how you talk about that crash that you had on that road trip and remembering how those guys helped you, and also talking about how when someone's had a crash on your event, now they've kind of got up, got out, and laughed about it. And I can kind of relate. It wasn't uh, an accident, but. One of the first road trip I ever went on across Europe um, was a supercar driving trip when I was 18. And the car that I was in, a McLaren 570, fell apart. Yeah. Like when I say it fell apart, like the electronic system failed, the roof failed, the parking brake failed. Uh, I remember a panel flew off the front left and smashed a BMW i8 behind. <laughs> the car had to leave, and I'll never forget it because. I had the Amovis toll tag yeah. to my phone yeah. and I'd left the toll tag in the window so the whole time it was going back to the UK on the recovery truck it was, open the it was racking up a bill on my phone I'll never forget Typical. but that's this day when everybody sort of came together rallied together to put you in um, their cars and complete the trip to make yeah. sure me and my mate had a good time was why that trip was actually probably so one of the you. best that I've been yeah. on so a rally is all about putting the right people in the right place and the right group in the right place how difficult have you found doing that? Because the car world is made up of all types of characters, people, Certainly genres, is. age groups, and all the rest of it. And I can imagine that a rally is made by the people on it. So how the hell do you do that? So when I started Cannon Run, 
When you, how long ago was it that you came on our trip? So it's probably worth saying at this point in the podcast, I came on the Canon Run, I believe it was in 2018 it was or 2019. 18. It was 18, yeah. And I've known Jay, I don't really know why, but it was prior to that, probably through social media for a very long time. And I've always had a great respect for what you've done with the brand and the business. However, I came on that trip and I didn't enjoy it. Yeah. And it ended up being that I didn't come again. Yeah. Now, just because I didn't enjoy the trip didn't mean that I didn't like you. Of course. Didn't like the organisation. I just really didn't enjoy the trip. Yeah. Some of the people that came, some of the driving, I was like, nope, it's yeah. not what I'm used to. I'm out. Yeah. What's been going on so, since 2018? Touching base on that subject. So it's very difficult to manage a client base and also to retain your customers from the first year of business and to also make everybody happy. So I never wanted Canon Run to be out of reach for the guys that supported my brand in year one and year two because there was people back then that came and still come to this day that really aren't in a financially strong position and did it for the love of me and the Canon Run and driving. Obviously as a business and as we move forward, I need the profits to grow so I can buy more stuff and I can you know, get more staff and grow the brand and get to more places and do more things. So obviously, naturally, the increased prices came against the trips. So the trip that you came on uh, was either spring break or September slammer. Spring break. And if I had no have known you then, like I know you now, I would have said to you before you booked the trip, that's not the trip for you to come on. Um, so we have spring break every year at a very low price, very affordable price. Mad low mm -hmm. price, yeah. I will say. And that was actually a question further yeah. on is how so, you do that. But uh, We do it because of all those guys that helped me in the beginning because all the guys that were on that trip with you pretty much were year one people not financially very strong clients in terms of you know like they're not really all supercar owners there was maybe what out of 50 cars there was probably 20 supercars and the rest were all your mid-level AMG M cars that sort of stuff was, do you think that was right? yeah I agree so if you had came on the mega run which I understand is a completely different price bracket I, w I feel that you would have come and had an absolute blast and then came back because the demographic on the mega run is very different to what it would be on spring break or September slammer. The level of clientele is very different. The level of vehicles is very different. The level of planning, the level of hotels, everything is completely different. Obviously in line get, with the price, in line with the price. When you have a bigger price, you have a bigger budget, you have a bigger team, you have you know, more ability to be able to create better stuff. So as an example, the Mega Run last year, it was absolutely phenomenal. We went to Annecy on night two. We dropped through Luxembourg, night one, and then into Annecy. Annecy sit, sits at the foot of the Mont Blanc Mountains. Beautiful. It's like the Lake District of France for anybody that doesn't know what Annecy is. We then planned our own route through the Italian Alps down to Monaco, and we stayed at the Fairmont Hotel. When we arrived at the Fairmont Hotel, all the staff were waiting outside at the front, the maids, the bartenders, everybody, all in their shirts, suits, everything, waiting to greet the cannon run. It was absolutely brilliant. And then from there, we really started to take it up a level in terms of, in terms of it not being a party event, rather it being a little bit more luxurious, a little bit more couple if you like, even a little bit more, you know what I mean? So we headed Warm. into, yeah, so we headed into Italy and we made our way to Parma first. So we stopped off at Parma Ham Museum and we did a Parma ham tasting, Lambrusco red wine tasting and cheese tasting in a beautiful courtyard surrounded by olive trees. And that was a regrouping point. From there, then we headed to Maranello and we stayed at the best hotel. If you'd have been to Maranello, you'll know the hotels are few and far between. So it's quite difficult. So we used the best hotel that we could find in Maranello. And then the next day we regrouped at the Ferrari Museum, full tour of the Ferrari Museum, guided by the staff. It was absolutely fantastic. And then the next bit was the best for me. So we headed to Orvieto, which was a regrouping point. Now, if you don't know Orvieto, Google it, YouTube it. It's literally like something out of Lord of the Rings. You come over the brow of this hill and then in the distance you see this almost like a miniature mountain. And at the top of this miniature mountain, it's walled all the way around it. And there's a great big cathedral in the middle. And you drive up this crazy road that goes all the way around to the top and then into the cathedral. It's mind blowing. So we regrouped there. And then we finished at the Hot Springs Hotel. So I can't remember the name of the area now. I'll have to look it up for you. But the hotel was five star, beautiful. And the 
there was 38 degree naturally heated hot springs all around the hotel. If anybody wants to see that, you, if you actually go on the Canon Runs YouTube channel, yeah. there is a one minute video of Mega Run and yeah. I have seen you can what see you're it. about. Or there's actually a video pinned to the top of my Instagram page, which is like a small documentary about Mega Run last year, which is shows all of that. But it was unbelievable. So we paid the hotel to stay um, open later in terms of the lifeguards at the hot springs and stuff, because even though it's a fully natural hot springs, if they have their guests there, they're liable for the situation okay, yeah. so we paid the hotel to keep the security open later the lifeguards open later we had a bar open and everybody just sat in the hot springs till maybe one in the morning drinking red wine it was great honestly it was really really brilliant and then it started to rain and you sat in really hot water and it was just perfect then we were supposed to finish in rome i've not very traveled around the south of italy or rome then south i got to rome it was awful so we then decided to go across to the opposite side of the country and finish in a place called Rimini, which was so, so, so during the trip, you basically altered the No, 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 no the that was the research trip. I altered Oh, it. okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> I was so, going to say, that sounds yeah. like absolute stress. No, 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 no. I didn't know. You, you, we always do a research trip, no matter... Um, the reason we're here today, so we're at Chilston Manor, which is in Kent, just outside of Kent, and this is the hotel that I'm using for the launch party and for the start line of spring break and probably the mega run as well. Um, and we're setting off tomorrow to Belgium. Um to go and do the research, to meet the hotels, to meet... Every, everything's different now. You have more budget, things change. So we always go and meet the hotels and do this because let's take Monaco as an example. So if we go and visit a hotel, so I'll give you the perfect example, the Hermitage. Went for a meeting with the Hermitage Hotel. We were treated like just another supercar driver in Monaco. When we went for a meeting with the Fairmont Hotel, which granted it is a little more tired than the Hermitage, However, it's a very motorsport-focused hotel, and the reception that we got there was 10 times better than we got from the staff at the Hermitage. Now, I know if I'm visiting that hotel as an individual business owner looking to bring you X amount of revenue, and they don't give me a good reception, what hope have my guests got I've got in one when they arrive? So all of this stuff is taken into consideration before we book a hotel. So you're explaining, though, basically what a dream trip looks like. Yes. You've, you've done the years, you've done the trips, you've racked up probably tens of thousands of miles across all of them. Yeah. And you're explaining what a dream trip the Mega Run looks like. Can you take me way back yes. before we get too far ahead and explain what your first ever I'll trip I'll tell you the worst like. nightmare in the world for me. So my first, not my first trip, my first trip was a disaster. It was called the Valentine's Run. I don't know why I thought couples would want to go away for Valentine's in cars and particularly when we had no brand power really it just didn't work so the second trip came it was a success in terms of bookings i had 40 cars on that trip which was mental but they weren't not, not a valentine's trip no the second this trip. was spring break this was spring break it was your first ever canon run i created I, I, I also created uk trips as well not only to keep it reachable for people because initially it was very hard to get a european trip off the ground without any substance to your brand so i needed something else which was so anyway nightmare I went on a research trip and I viewed a hotel in just south of Glasgow it was, Carlisle. <laughs> Rough enough <laughs> as it is. But I'm also young at this point. I'm 21, 22. I'm very novice. Don't really know the world, etc. I'm learning everything. So I went to view this hotel and they gave me this amazing deal on rooms and they showed me three rooms and the rooms were fairly good. They were up to scratch for the level of business I was operating at the time. And I thought, great, I've, got a bit of, I've actually got a bit of profit margin in this. Fantastic. So anyway, we got to this hotel on the trip, and within 10 minutes, I had 60 people in reception screaming, like, you've brought us to a dungeon. It's terrible. So I'm like, what are you on about? Like, I've been here, I've seen the rooms. They'd refurbished three of the rooms in this hotel and hadn't done the rest of them and told me, this is the level of rooms, Mr. Cannon, blah, 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 blah. So my business partner, who's with me now, James, who you've met, he was at this point a client and he was one of the higher clients driving a Ferrari F12 with his pals who were in Aventadors and all the rest of it. And uh, he kind of saved me bacon a bit really. So he come to me and he went, the first thing I did, which I think saved my own bacon to start with was me, my sister and a couple of my friends. We went, we ran over to the spa shop and got air deodorizer, bleach, all that sort of stuff. Like there was half eaten chicken under the beds and stuff in the rooms. It was like, really really rough so we were running around cleaning hoovering like doing the staff's job so everyone kind of looked and i think they were all a lot older than me and i think they kind of looked and went he's trying to sort this out do you know what i mean you can see he's trying 
So then James said to me, listen, do yourself a favour, put two grand behind the bar. At, at, where, where do we go out? Went in the evening to somewhere like Revolution Vodka Bar it was. So I put two grand behind the bar and he said, do your announcement. And when you do your announcement, I'll kind of chirp up a little bit. So I pulled everybody in and I said, listen, guys, I'm really sorry this has happened. I explained the situation like I've just explained it to you. And uh, I said, I've put two grand behind the bar for you tonight. Well, everyone was over the moon at that because it was quite a lot of drinks and big night out. So then James went, yeah, and listen, guys, to be honest, let's have it right. I've just laid on my bed and had a fag here. Where could you do that at another hotel? And everyone just started laughing then and it became, it came, it became a little bit of a joke and a memory that was, you know, is now laughed upon. And But at the time it was the Ow. worst nightmare imaginable if you're a rally owner. And, and something that I think is also worth saying is when you're dealing with a group of people, I actually find it's a lot harder when it's a kind of smaller intimate group than it is a, a large great big one. crowd. Yeah. Because in a crowd you don't really know anybody. When you've got a small intimate group, especially if those people you know and have paid you and you respect, like the level of like anxiety just goes through the roof yeah, when massively. you're dealing with that. Especially as a first event. So I can't imagine how tough those initial days would have been. But from there, what did the business look like? How did you start to develop your events? Because you've got things like, as you've mentioned, the Canon UK events, and you did UK events at low prices, and then that was how you'd also get people enticed to then click on and get onto the bigger events. And also to Europe. create content for me and to give you know the website some substance in terms of what start was on it. A brand. Yeah, yeah. Um, from then on, from that event onwards, it went pear shaped. <laughs> completely so I had to go and get a job and I started because it was just I was putting everything I had into the business and I had no money left so I'm like well I'm not going to quit so I need to do something now to generate money again to put back in again so um, I got a job with Park Dean Resorts selling holiday homes so I kind of did my homework on the sales industry because I am probably what you'd call a salesman I can talk to anybody I can sell to people I'm very relatable and I can be like water in terms of adapting to any kind of surrounding situation or people that I'm with. So it was the biggest sort of commission that was available within the sales industry across all of the different platforms that were available. Um, thousand pound average commission per unit, 25, 27 K basic salary a year. But I didn't realize when I went to work there, it'd be seven days a week and I was living on a caravan park in Skegness. So it was fairly different to what I was used to. First month at work, I did 11 and a half grand um, paid in, so I was over the moon. Second month at work, I did 11, two, just missed my first one. Month three... There's going to be people flocking to work at Park Dean Resorts. Uh, mate, do you know what, if, 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 if you've got no partner and you've got no kids, perfect job to go to, to if you're prepared to graft, to build yourself a pot to then start to look at investing or growing yourself because it is a seven day a week job there because you're on commission. If your deal's taken till seven, eight at night, you're going to stay in the office till seven, eight at night because you want that grand. So um, I did a year there. So average between eight and 11 grand a month. Lived in a caravan. First six months I was really good. Kept my head screwed on, stacking money, you know, really focusing on what I was doing. Um, and then on month six, I just thought, fuck it, I'm going to go and buy a Ferrari 458 now and then Range Rover SVR. So I went to James, my business partner now, who I'm with now, went to his dealership, which he had at the time, and bought an SVR under 458 the same day, which I didn't think at the time was a very intelligent business move, but I was also a petrol head. But it was actually one of the best moves I've done because going from an Audi R8 manual 2007 in blue which was a really bad car, bad, not a bad car, they're a great car, bad colour combo, hearing aid beige interior, like really not a nice thing, into what, the 488 wasn't out at this point, remember, so going into a 458 and an SVR and having them all branded with the Canon run and hitting all these events, it put me on the map because at this time, social media wasn't what it was today. You didn't see a Ferrari every day like you do on your news feed now. And when you did see a Ferrari, particularly a newer one, it was like, wow, did you just see that Ferrari go past? So at the time, having your car branded and all that, it did bits for your business. So worked out well enough, still carried on stacking. Then another six months down the line, I was on the mega run and my boss at the time was on the trip as a customer in his Aventador Pirelli. And we were at the top of the Stelvio Pass and we stood there and just looking at the view and he, I remember it now. He said to me, he went, you're not coming back, are you? And I went, no, nah, I'm not coming back. I'm not coming back. And then that was it. I went fucking hell for leather and 
put everything I could possibly put into Canon Run. Got back off that trip. Um, and then James rang me, my business partner now, and said, um, do you want to come for a meeting? I'm like, yeah, fuck it, sweet, let's go for a meeting. I didn't know what it was about, really. He got there and he basically said to me, I can elevate your brand in terms of bringing new revenue to the business because you're missing out on this, 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 and this. You've got this nailed, you've got this nailed, but you're missing all this in between. I said, all right, sweet. So we did a deal um, and then we became 50-50 business partners in the Canon Run. And from there, it was real sort of momentum phase up until... Just put a time stamp on that for me. <laughs> 10 years this year. 10 years ago? Ten year, no, no. So me and James have been in business six years. And we're now, yeah, this, this is the 10th year of the Canon Run this year. This is 10 years. So the Canon Run is you and James 50-50 combined in that business yes because what's difficult is when you speak to multiple different entrepreneurs and business owners across the uk i actually have a business that i own 50 50 with my partner louise a digital marketing agency in surrey not too far away um called tweak but i do understand especially of looking into other companies that is probably one of the hardest decisions you can make in business is going for someone so uh usually entrepreneurs are really dictator oral kind of dictators and sometimes working together it doesn't click but when you do find that right person it can click so how has that relationship been with you over six years the canon run um very very good as a whole I, I think i kind of fell in love with james himself really as a person more than anything like he's just one of them guys that doesn't matter who meets him you have instant respect for him instant time for him he's just that you know that that sort of person and um and the week before Canon Run Mega Run, obviously at this point I'm growing my business. I've only got my Ferrari 458. I didn't have multiple supercars like I've got today. And I, in fact, I hadn't even been involved with any supercars. So being around them was such a pleasure and, you know, a wow experience at that time. Obviously, as you know, everything becomes, it wears off a little bit, doesn't it, after 10 years? Yeah. So um, he rang me the week before the trip and he went, Would you, is there any chance you go and pick a McLaren up for me? I was like... This is very random. I've got a customer ring me. I don't really know where you go and pick a McLaren. I said, yeah, I'll go and pick it up for you. Yeah. So drove to London, got in it, drove the car back. He rang me. So what's it like? I said, um, look, with all due respect, you're a big lad because he's a lot taller than me and he's a lot wider than me. I said, and this is a very small car. Like I'm, this. what was it? It was an MP12, I think. No, it wasn't. It was a 650 Spider. That's what it was. And they're really not very big inside a McLaren at all. So he went, oh, fuck, is it that bad? I went, it's not that bad for me, but I think you're going to do a week in this car and struggle on the trip. So uh, two days later, he brings me back. He says, right, could we, is any chance you go London for me again? <laughs> Bear in mind, he's, he's happy to pay for my time or whatever else. But I said, what for? He said, well, I've, I've just parted some McLaren in for a Ferrari F12. Now, bear in mind, this is six, seven years ago. So again, the 812 wouldn't have been out then. So you were being paid to yes. go and pick up a Ferrari F12 yeah, for and drop his McLaren off for him yeah right and then bring it back to Canon Run HQ and have it branded up for him for the sticker pack for the rally now you'd have been in your early 20s then. yes I think if you asked 100 people in a survey that knew Jay knew the Canon Run but let's say didn't know you know you yeah. knew of you what would your perception and persona of Jay be uh, on no a, across, or back then back, back then and maybe go so just wait, hold on for me if if I then painted that picture and I'm looking back on the things that built you as an entrepreneur in the early stages from not having those those cars and suddenly being earning lots of money from something you weren't expecting to do in going out and buying your own car suddenly the ego the, everything starts to climb a little bit then I'm being paid to go and pick up an F12 this is just just how yeah. life is in those days so looking do, if what do you think others were beginning to think of, of you at that point if other people's opinion and what my opinion is is I think would be two different things look 33 year old Jay looking back at 24 25 year old Jay would go he's a hot headed little dickhead but I understand what he's <laughs> trying to achieve and I can see he's passionate about it that's okay. what I would think looking back now I, I only know that I was a hot headed little dickhead because I'm me and I know myself and how I was and how I am. From a public perspective within the Canon Run or our viewers online, I think everybody would have been able to see just how excited I was to drive that car. Probably just how grateful I was to drive that car and not like I feel I deserve to drive this, but wow, this is fucking amazing that I'm getting to drive this. I think that's what they would have picked up five or six years ago from that. Do you think, I'll tell you what I think then, because uh, it comes ahead where I came on a trip back in that period and didn't enjoy it 
Um, um, what I'm kind of wondering is, is this. When I put together that persona, those things that happen all together, it creates uh, uh, a group of hot-headed lads, for say, usually with very over-attractive women with them as well, living it up, partying, drinking, whatever else, ragging cars like they don't know, left, right and centre. Loads of testosterone. And I came from a background, it's just the cards were all dealt and different things, where I grew up going to the rugby with my old man sitting around with 55-year-olds around Let the table. Let me just stop you thing. because I'll, I'll forget what I was going to say. So, the when you came on that trip... I was. I had to do everything. I didn't have the staff that I had today. I didn't have the ability to bring people in and manage certain areas of the business. So, as I said to you before the podcast started, I don't think we were filming. I don't drink. I never have been a drinker. I don't enjoy it. It's not that it makes me any type of way other than sleepy. Like, I'll have a glass of wine and I'm like, oh, I just want to go to bed. That's just, it just really kills me dead. So I don't drink. I've, I've never needed to or wanted to. I also really don't like being in a really busy place in a party setting, live music, flashing lights, hundreds of people. I don't, I don't enjoy it. it. It really puts me on edge. I don't feel completely secure. I like to be, my perfect evening would be a group of friends, my missus, my dog, most important, sorry, Soph, barbecue, good food, maybe a shandy. That's my perfect night. Can, can you understand from how long I've known you? Yes, the, percep the perception how that you that had. How that sounds absolutely... Mental for you. It sounds like bollocks yeah. to me, so is what it sounds so like. So any of my closest friends will tell you, that's Jay. There came a point, which is obviously where we discussed the changes just within the business of moving Mega Run into a slightly different position to where it's maybe been seen before. You also have to remember, Modball and Gumball are both known as drive all day, party all night. People booking rallies because of the perception they have about Gumball and Modball automatically think, or did automatically think, Canaman will be the same too. And if you remember, our slogan used to be, it's going off. So that's gone now. And they came to a point where I got tired of going to the clubs that I didn't want to be in. I got tired of drinking alcohol that I didn't want to drink. I got tired of having... And again, this is going to sound really, really bad, but I'm very, very, very transparent. Having bullshit conversations with drunk people that had no interest in me at all and was being dribbled over and people slurring their words and all that. Like, people love all different types of stuff. I'm not knocking drinking at all. And the Cannon Run, of course, goes to luxury places, luxury bars, luxury restaurants. However, my business partner, James, loves to have a drink. And he's a very happy drunk and a very cheerful drunk and still maintains a, a level keel even when he's had a drink so now the cannon run we select we carefully select the places that we go to to try and retract the want or need of going to a club so we'll try and land you in the middle of italy at hot springs to keep the class to the keep vibe. that vibe going and plan the routes that, that way now which again you have to remember when you came i was still very much in a position of learning no i understand that I, but what that does and what I'm trying to get at and then we can, we can talk about how that's changed and because that's a massive part of your journey in the business. But what it does do is you were called the Canon Run then and you're still called the Canon Run now. Yes. So when someone thinks of the Canon Run that's maybe been on before, but if I'd have come from the position of I was... 18, yes. had no no dad with his own business and had grown up in an environment around entrepreneurs and I'd suddenly made a hundred million pounds mining it Bitcoin. It would perfect trip for you. And I got on the thing with my mates and I was just fucking having it off, literally. I would have absolutely loved that trip. Yeah. But what it did teach me about putting groups of people together is it's actually so difficult to select the right people to put together on a trip. The fact that you're sat here telling me that you didn't actually like that environment it's crazy to me. I had to build my brand, didn't I? So did you enjoy running the business? Yeah, I enjoyed running the business because of my love of cars. Like, let's be realistic about it. The trips are were, when you were there, 30% drinking and partying and 70% cars driving, talking about cars in car parks where we stop off and regroup and cars. It's all cars, isn't it? So at the beginning, I was happy to suffer and this is going to sound mad for people watching. I, really, I, I hate going out. Like, I really don't like it at all. I've never liked it. But I was happy to suffer doing things that I didn't want to do, like any other entrepreneurial person would do to get a business off the ground. And if the demographic of clients that I had back then, which is very different to what it is now, were that demographic of it's going off, let's neck a bottle of vodka, then I'm going to have to kind of entertain those people until I'm in a position where... 
I don't select my clients, but I target a certain level of people now. But I also target different demographics for different events, as I said before. So spring break, it's not by any means it's going off, but it is that level of vehicles like you experienced, and it will always be that because that's so what spring break is. would you still recommend is. that someone like me not go on spring break? If I knew you, then I would have advised you to come and do maybe the Cannon Run Island if you couldn't afford to do the Mega Run, not you personally, but if it was somebody like you, I would advise you to do the Irish trip, which it is Ireland and they do love a drink, but they have a drink in a different way to the people in Britain have a drink. It's like you're coming to have a drink with my family because we love you. Like that's how it is in Ireland rather than it's going off and we're spraying champagne because we're a dickhead of a Rolex and Irish. So, um, so yeah, the the demographics are different for each event, and we've kind of nailed it now. After ten years, we've nailed it. One of the most important things about running any business, and I remember how every single board meeting used to start at our previous business, so it just got drummed into me, is safety. Whether you're in a factory environment, whether you're in whatever, if you are bringing people together in a group, you ultimately have a responsibility in yes. that company. Responsibility also creates stress on someone that's running it and all the rest of it. At the beginning, for those years, we now mention, and I totally understand why, I've dialed it down, dialed down the trips, more of a vibe than it's going off. Our you slogan now is join our family. You're com you were combining alcohol and cars in the evening, sometimes till three, four in the morning. Yeah. And get up and get on the road at yes. eight AM. Yeah. What is some of the maddest shit you ever had to deal with? Um And what did it teach you? Do you know what? It's gonna sound mad, but very luckily I've never had a major accident on Cannon Run apart from the Audi R eight last year on the Mega Run, which turned out like when we arrived at the scene. I know we're going off tangent here a little bit. That's fine. Like, I said, is he in the car? Is he in the car? Where's the driver? And he stood there with his hands on. Nice me, bro. I'm like, my head fell off. Like, I couldn't believe you stood there talking to me, looking at the car. So I've been really lucky, but I always do a driver's briefing every morning and everybody is responsible for their own vehicle, their own driving, their own ability, their own risks. But at the same time, I do say to everybody, if you're going to put people at risk, get off of our event because we've got corporate sponsors we've got our own brand to protect and if anybody dies on the cannon run I'm not like Gumball I wouldn't just close that event and then keep working I'd probably shut my business because my mind wouldn't probably be able to cope with having a death on my shoulders do you know what I mean if I felt any type of way of being responsible for it so do you think you've come close? the R8 I would say he really scraped death's door but he stood there in his sandals. So, so have you ever kicked anybody off the can and run for yeah, bad driving? Yeah, I have, yeah. Several times. How does that go down? Depends who it is. <laughs> really. Uh, whether, like A six foot two massive guy in Monaco who's had a fair few drinks who was actually the humblest out of everybody that took accepted it and just left. But you were probably the most frightened. <laughs> but James came to me and said, you're going to have to tell him to go. And I was like... Yeah, oh great, I'll go and tell him to go. Goes, yeah, same. You, you go and tell him to go. No, you're going to have to go and tell him to go. You know, He knows who you are, he doesn't know who I am. I was like, fuck's sake. And he was just like, yeah, understood, mate, no worries, that's sound. Um, listen, people take it all types of ways, but I, I state it, like, listen, you ain't having your money back, and you're leaving, that's it. So, controversial debate, Yeah. where is that line? Because we're in supercars. Okay, so the line is, and we, we, we tell you this line now in our driver's meetings, we know everybody puts their foot down on a supercar tour. doesn't matter if you're doing Gumball, supercar driver, the Cannon Run. Everybody does it. Fact. If we or our clients report or have evidence of... and So like, if one person comes over and says, oh, he overtook me, I'm not going to go and moan too much. But if three people come to me and say, that idiot in that Audi R8 V10 just overtook three of us on a blind bend on the brow of a hill, you're gone. See you later. You want, to, you want to undertake on the motorway, like on the hard shoulder. You want to overtake on the brow of a hill or on a blind bend or something else with that level of stupidity behind it, then you're leaving the trip because you're not only going to kill yourself, you're also probably going to wipe out the three supercars that are following you and ruin my brand as well as my life. Do you find that easier to manage now than it yeah. was back in the days when I came? When I when you came on the trip and when everybody else was on that trip, 
Cameron wasn't taken as seriously as what it is today. It wasn't as big as what it was today. And people kind of also knew that we were fighting back then to get bookings. We were cold calling people. We were posting adverts galore and all the rest of it. So I think everyone kind of knew that we, Cameron needed them more than, you know, they needed the Cameron. So it was like some of the lads actually were like, fuck it, if he gets pissed off, he gets pissed off, fuck him. Whereas now it's like people really want to be part of this brand because they understand that we've been here 10 years we are here to stay. We've got a phenomenal network, a phenomenal family, and we've started to obviously now, no, not we, people have now started to realise that, oh, maybe actually they're not drive all day, party all night. Maybe they're actually a really strong network of guys. Most of them are entrepreneurs, blah de blah blah and they want to be a part of it. Did you ever think about changing the brand? In terms of the name? Mm. No. Did you ever worry that there was a perception of the brand when it got tougher and more no. competitive? I don't worry. I get... I don't care really, to be honest. I know that through hard work, dedication, the proof is in the pudding. Don't need to stand there and say, we're this, we're that, we're the other. We'll go out there, we show people what we are and the transformation of our brand over the last five years now speaks for itself. Our, so our client base for the Mega Run is ridiculous, Ben. Do you always think bigger is always better? In terms of business, no. Well, it's interesting because when we go to any show across the country, take Autosport, one of the latest ones as an example, usually the biggest stand at the show is usually got a huge, great gold blow up cannon run logo no 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 it's not blow up it's a fully built custom stand that was about 50k with that's the yeah, one yeah. that's the one I'm yeah. sure many people have seen it with a truck behind them people are in and out in times of like a lounge environment and when I take that and then apply it to what I knew of the cannon run two different things it was two different things yeah so to answer your question yeah I think bigger's better because let's say 18 year old Ben had have walked into Autosport and saw the Canon run if 18 year old sorry cut back if 18 year old Ben had saw us at Autosport when Ben was 18 I was with back to back on another company on a very small stand with a marquee with some pop up boards and my Audi R8 if 18 year old Ben had have seen that stand this is you by the way not most 18 year olds because he's very different to most 18 year olds <laughs> if you would have seen that stand you would have walked straight past it and not batted an eyelid at it if you would have walked in and saw either this year or last year with the Koenigsegg, the SLR, the lorry, the lights, the, everything there, you would think, wow, these guys really probably know what they're doing rather than what's this kid doing under a marquee here with his trainers on. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I think bigger is better in terms of your online awareness, the way you present your business, the way you dominate an event, the way you are powerful wherever you go however behind the scenes when there's two sides to the business you've got the forefront of your business and you've got the back end of your business and the back end of your business is where the office is and everything's run from because obviously without all of you know doing all the shows and the events and buying and selling the crazy cars and coming even here today it involves invoices receipts VAT tax wages PAYE insurance diesel accounts you know how much stuff goes on in the background so and, and all that stuff requires money. It does. And the bit that I never understood, because lots of people that proclaim to think that they can figure stuff out just from looking at stuff face value, for say, try and add stuff up in their head and make it work. Can I give you a classic example that's going on at the minute? Car competitions. Yes. Because it's so easy to go on a website, yeah. go, well, hang on a second, that item costs X, and they're selling that many tickets at that price, and all the mathematicians come out and think they, they know how much money the company's made or what they've done and all the rest of it. However, when I was younger, I would look at the brand and go, how on God's earth are you getting away with surviving. running a trip or surviving <laughs> yeah. when surely that hotel, when I go on the website, it's like 120 quid a night yeah. and we're going to it with food yeah. for like three nights and organising all the rest of it for like 320 quid. I, I, had to suffer. I couldn't get my head around it. I had to, I had to suffer and do no profit really for the first two or three years to not dominate the market necessarily to breach to breach it to come into it to get a name and the only way I could do that was which was it worked I'm here today but looking back now people would have sat back and gone this trip's going to be shite because I can guarantee if that they didn't know the hotels we were using until they came to the trip they didn't know the hotels were going to be good but for me, looking at that trip, 320 quid, I'm fucking going on that. There's a hotel to play going to put us in a dungeon. That's what I'd be thinking now. And being too cheap online sometimes has a total opposite effect. It's almost like how we think about buying steak in a restaurant. Correct. If it's 15 quid, you, I go, 
no, you're all right, yeah. to be honest. Like, because I, I expect a it's just a perception isn't it? in my head. Like, Whereas, I want that. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, it's a tricky one, really, trying to be the do the best decision for your business. I could have, I could have done more profitable events back then, but I might not have had the bookings, and I might not have grown my brand, and I might not have, you know, the content I was also getting off of these events had a value to it. The people that were coming on these events and being added into my network had a value to it. So even though the company was making zero money on the books, there was value being added to the business left, right and centre. Network was growing, content was pending, relationships were growing, and then sponsors started to pay a little bit of attention. I think my first sponsor, I took 200 quid or something, and it was literally a sticker on a car, and that was it. Now it's very different. It's a marketing package for 12 months, and we target the correct demographic of business for the individual that we're working for through some modern and quirky ways of marketing, not your typical sort of Google AdWords and boosted targeted ads and all the rest of it. We do do that for the companies we work with, but that's not the be all and end all of the way we market a brand. Do you believe in the phrase sex sales? Yeah, but not in our industry. Our sex sales in my industry, if you're 18 to 30 and single, and that then brings everything that I don't like, partying, drinking till four in the morning. Has that changed? In terms of the Cannon Run, yeah, yeah. So we have, uh, we have, we don't have the Cannon Run girls anymore. We have Cannon Run hostesses. That is mind blowing because that was such a big part of the brand. It was, yeah. And it was, it was strange because when I was on the, I do remember well, a the moment. Cannon Run girls had their own page and everything. I, I do remember a moment though where I was in a Tesco car park on the Isle of Wight. Yeah. And this black truck pulled up, and there were six girls in latex on yeah. the back of that truck dancing. Yeah. <laughs> forgive me I'll never forget this because it's one of the most awkward moments I've ever seen in my life the music was blaring the speakers were booming in the car park bass going god knows what music it was it, it <laughs> I don't know but you can imagine I wasn't driving the truck by the way no. and this 80 something maybe 90 year old grandma pushed her trolley past and looked up and went like me <laughs> <laughs> and walked up past. but I was Brand just like awareness, mate. no press is bad press I was like what is going on? Is that the same now? No, it's not. No. Okay. No. So um, we have our kind of run hostesses now and the girls that come on the trips now, we don't really, we don't have a, eight or nine girls. We take maybe three. They're girls that have been with our brand for a long time. So they know the brand inside and out. Obviously, if they've been around me for a long time and they've survived around me, then they're obviously fairly good people because I don't, tolerate having fools about me it just doesn't work for me and my mindset so um their main focus now is so when you arrive at a hotel no matter how much we prepare a hotel you've got a hundred people coming you need to have more than one person checking them in mm -hmm. they need to be pre-checked in sometimes they still have two there or three there and it can still take 45 minutes to get everybody checked in the girl's job is to go around everybody in that queue and take the edge off of the waiting time have you had a nice day? How's your car performing? Have you had any issues? Are you enjoying the trip? No? Oh, what's the matter? You're not, you're not had it. Come straight to me. Mr. Jones has just said to me, he's not enjoying this because this has happened. I'm going to then know because he hasn't felt, some people feel like they can't go to the organiser and moan. Just that's how they are. Maybe too polite. If it was me, I'd go straight to the organiser because I'd want to sort my problem out. So I then started to find things out as well. Or it's a confidence thing. Yeah, or a confidence because thing I too. Because I go back to when you're surrounded by loads of a load of yeah, young yeah. men, yeah. testosterone Testo blind, yeah, yeah. blingy, yeah. all the rest of it, quite, it's it's sometimes daunting for yeah. someone that's not like that. Yeah, way yeah. I agree with that too, yeah, I agree. So what happens then is I start to find out, we don't really get this anymore, but like a couple of years ago when we first started to change the brand, um, I was finding out things that I would have never really found out and I was able to fix problems before they were a problem. Do you know what I mean? So it was like a great insight to what was going on. Um, the girls that work with us now as well, they also are fully trained on all of our sponsors. So if somebody wants to have a genuine conversation with me about meeting somebody, normally on the Cannon Run trips, it's, Jay, can you introduce me to so-and-so because we've definitely got some business synergy there and I think we could probably work together. The girls know who's who. They know that that person there is the owner of Start Solar. They know that person there is the owner of Quicksilver Exhaust. They know that that person there is Aaron Quilter from Bill Stein. They fully know our brand inside and out. So if I'm too busy, they actually can have a substantial conversation with the clients and also 
a business conversation with the clients too because they know about our brands, the people that we work with and the network that we've created over the last sort of 10 years because they've been there for a long time. And the three that are with us now, are, are said, as I said, they're the best ones, the most respectful ones and the ones that have gone happily with the changes of the brand. Has there ever been any cases or how do you deal with the girls getting involved with members? Oh, on it's a trip? nightmare, mate, honestly. So every, every trip I do a staff briefing and it's not so much as a nightmare now. This is going back when we had the Canon Run girls. So I'd say to the girls, and I'm probably giving you all inside information here a bit too much, but I'd always say to the girls, girls, don't sleep with the clients. Number one, you don't want to be a rolling laugh between all the lads because you'll feel shit about it. And let me tell you, if you sleep with one of them, this was obviously going back a few years back when it was a rolling sort of, not a party, but you'll be laughter of the group, like, and you'll be talk of the town and everyone will be talking about you and you'll ruin your trip. And, um, and I used to say to all of them, and the idea is that the lads come back. So if you give it to them and you go and sleep with them, then they're probably not going to come back again because they've come, they've had a great time, they've done what they've in their head wanted to do and achieved. Whereas if you don't sleep with them and keep the wheels spinning, keep them on the wheel and they'll come back. So that's how I used to look at it. Were they paid to go on the trip? Um, mega run, we used to cover expenses because hotel every night, five star, two girls per room. Like before you know it, you've got a major bill for food, drink, travel. It's a lot, do you know what I mean? Whereas the UK trips, the Christmas event that we host, we do pay the wages for that because it's more sort of there's a less there's less of a cost for us to bring them to those events for a two night period or a one night period so we don't mind being fair there was the benefit to them that the fact that they if they were models etc they would have content exposure or the rest of it so you were trying to manage someone that you didn't employ for say that was kind of there for free helping out not sleeping very with difficult. a load of young testosterone and also males. none of them adhered to the 1am curfew that we put in place either so that's the but then trip. how do you manage that? Oh, Mr. Mr. Fowler, you've spent X on this trip. You're, it's now bedtime. No, no, not for the clients. The girls. The girls. Right. So my point to the girls was, if you adhere to the 1am curfew and you're sat there and you're the attention of 10 lads in that club, I'm going now, guys. Well, why are you going? Well, we've got to be up early in the morning, haven't we? We're all driving cars. And then if all the girls actually did that, which if they were getting paid at the time, they would have done, <laughs> then the lads probably would have followed suit. Because the girls have all left now. So it's pointless while we're out for. Yeah, do you know what I mean? So in my head, that was how it would work. But the problem is, is girls can't help themselves either. And no matter what anybody says to me, like everyone has this portrayal of guys being tearaways, alcohol, sex and partying and all that. A lot of girls are just as bad and can't control themselves either. And you know the day and age we live in today. Like it's completely different to what it was when my nan and granddad were together or even when my mum and dad met. Like, it's a completely different day and age and probably a lot more acceptable today to sleep around than it was 20 years ago. So it's a very, very, very difficult one. But as the business has transitioned into the new way of the Canon run, the girls that are remaining now don't provide these problems for us. And they know because I've made examples on trips and gone, right, I'll tell you what then, see you, you're going home. Do you think you're viewed by the rest of the automotive community in the UK in terms of um, owners of other car rally brands, other other events companies, um, detailing brands, whatever it may be, if they just knew a bit of Jay, do you think you'd be known as the bad boy of the car industry? No. Do you think you were? Yeah. When do you think that changed? Probably last year. <laughs> I don't know. I was known as, let's have it right, I was known as, you don't really cross Jay because he'll fucking ruin your brand, he'll rip you a new arsehole online, he doesn't really give a fuck. And I decided to do a podcast with him. Um, it's true though, like I can remember, like I've, I've really, I would never, ever, ever create a problem. I've never been that person. But if somebody was unfair with me, the way that I would deal with it back then to how I would deal with it now. And there's probably a five-year gap, really, from being genuine. Or okay. maybe, maybe four, three, five. We'll stick with five. I would go in on you and I would <laughs> really, really not leave it like a dog with a bone. Like, I had no issue saying, you've done fucking this and you've done this and I'm telling everyone so you all don't get led in by this guy or you don't make the same mistakes we've made or whatever it is. And if you've got a problem, come see me. That's how I was. That was my attitude. It doesn't really get you anywhere and you have to grow up a little bit to understand that. But I also haven't got to the position I'm in in life by being a pushover because there's plenty of people out there that would walk all over you if they could, which you've probably experienced this growing up. You've been 
around your dad and you've had a, probably a fairly good upbringing and you've been fairly privileged. Like I had my nan and granddad there for me. There was nothing, I wasn't spoiled with like watches or anything like that. But in terms of having what I needed and what I wanted, I had it, do you know what I mean? So some people can't relate to that and they will try and take the piss because they've had not a very... Yeah, respectful no, father that. figure or a very respectful granddad around them or whatever it is so I've had to kind of be the way I've been because sometimes in life it's necessary to let people know oh actually we can't just fuck him about we can't just take the piss out of him we can't just push him round and he's going to he's, he's, he's going to accept it <laughs> I'm not do you know what's mad about the car well is I was asked this to Matt Armstrong who was last week's guest is when you look at the YouTube scene the guys yeah. that make the money from YouTube I said are the people um, in the space competitors or collaborators? Because technically, you're all competing for watch time. Views, yeah. And, and views, but then you need to collaborate to make good content, and sometimes that comes off one another. If you then apply that to the events and rally space not in happening. the UK, <laughs> that it's, it's not happening. It's not happening. So I, I, get, I get people weekly ring, message, email to collab with us, and... We don't collab really with anybody because we have sponsorship packages available, which are an active marketing package for a 12-month period. And if we ever get a rally try and collab with us, it's always a rally which has either just started or is smaller than us. And why would I go and do 10 years of business to stand in front of a camera and say, we're collabing with Spunk Rally? who've just popped up out of nowhere 12 months ago and he's a really nice lad and he wants to grow his brand and I'm sure he's going to do really well. But unfortunately, go and invest your own two to five million quid and 10 years of business and 10 years of growth and 10 years of blood, sweat, tears, sleepless nights, working and selling caravans and all the rest of it. And then you, you'll be entitled to a, a shot. As a YouTuber and correct some of the channel, I look up to other creators. I look up to Stephen Bartlett, Diary yeah. CEO. Fantastic how they built that podcast. Glad, glad you're going to ask this question. Joe Rogan. I look Who up do I look to up all to? Of those. You're in the rally space. Yeah. The biggest name... I believe, yep. in terms of worldwide, is Gumball. Yeah, there's very few people there's that no have not it. heard of the yeah. Gumball Rally. Hundred percent. Do you look up to the Gumball Rally? Looked up to, used to, past tense. So when I was young, Gumball was fucking wow. Like, look at this. This is the dream. Like, and just explain for those that may not know what Gumball is, the price point. And Gumball, just... I believe, is in the region of about fifty to seventy thousand to enter the event. And then I believe there's a minimum spend per evening. This is what I've been told by people that have attended the events. And then I also believe that you probably wouldn't get on the event unless you were somebody, really. So it's very different to Cannon Run in terms of pricing points. Not really the hotels, because you can't really book any better hotels than what we book in the areas that we go to. Uh, public crowds are a lot bigger on Gumball, but we see that as a safety risk because you're a rolling target when you're in supercars with watches, diamonds, jewellery, possessions etc so we don't really like that and we try and keep it under wraps there's lots of different things if you gumball is very much more drive all day party all night as we said very much a rolling rock star lifestyle very much fast cars as mad as it gets yeah as mad as it gets like you've seen the have you ever been on it no but i've seen multiple videos from teams in car footage nightclub footage loads of it. it's all over the internet isn't it? it's the oldest brand in what we do so Anyway, so yeah, it, it's an amazing brand. Max has built something phenomenal. He's built a monster, hasn't he? Like, he's done really, really well. So, my initial trip that I did after four years of business was called the Cannon Run 3000 because our European tour was 3,000 kilometres, bang on, dead. So, the Cannon Run business hadn't changed. It was just the Cannon Run 3000 because it was 3,000 kilometres. And Gumball was called Gumball 3000. And Gumball sued me. And at this time, and I had no money, and it nearly shut my business. Max nearly fucking ruined me. So Cost your me. hand on heart sit here today saying and that I, was not because you wanted any relationship with the Gumball 3000. Well, I, 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 how could you possibly even get the two mixed up unless you're absolutely thick, the cannon run Gumball? And let's say even if you did get it mixed up, are you going to go and give 360 quid for the trip when you know Gumball 60 grand or 50 grand or 30 grand at the time? It's too, it's like it's like Umbro being looked at by Versace, like at the time. Like that was the two levels of business. Do you so know what Gumball I mean? sued you. So Gumball sent us a cease and desist um, from a huge solicitors firm in London, um, and I didn't really know what to do. I didn't have the money to fight it. Went to 
another really big law firm who's off, I've worked out who was the opposition I've always been fairly clued up I worked out who this law firm's opposition rival law firm was so I went to them and I had a meeting in Leeds with them and I said look what's this going to cost me like I, I don't want to shut my doors obviously like I want to keep going and he said you're probably going to be somewhere in the region of 25-30k to fight this and that'll probably be a settle up out of court it won't get to court because this is wrong this is wrong and this is wrong in Gumball's copyright infringement bollocks and all the rest of it like you can't trademark a number like, you can't do it, it's bollocks. However, they've got a big, big bank account and the ability to go, right, sweet, well, let's go to court then, if you want. So I said, right, so if we go to court, will I win? He said, yeah, you'll win this in court, no problem. But to get to that point, it's going to cost you 150, 200 grand to get there because you're fighting them. And I have experienced that first time. So actually. I couldn't do anything. I was backed into a position where I had no choice but to kind of adhere to it and lose the 3,000 off my European events, which... I could have called it the fucking Canon Run 2500 if it had been 2500 kilometres, but it was 3000 kilometres dead, and no one can argue that because that's what it was. And even in the logo, it had the Canon Run 3000 KMS written at the end of the 3000. Now, people can look at it however they want. I think you've got to be thick if you can get the words Gumball and the Canon Run mixed up. If you're a Gumball customer, you're a Gumball customer. You know the word Gumball. You're not going to go, oh, what's that rally called again? That really big one that everyone goes on, all them celebrities. It's not going to happen. You know what it's called because it's everywhere. It's globally known. So my opinion now is that Max is greedy. He's selfish. And he would happily sit there and see a 23, 24-year-old lad put out of business. Because that's what he would have achieved. And that's what he wanted to achieve. He wanted to put me out of business. So I'll happily say, as I've said many times on different podcasts before, Fuck you, Max. You tried to sue me. I'm still here. I definitely wouldn't be going anywhere. And at this age now, if someone popped up and they called themselves the... Road to Success Rally 3000. Yeah, I wouldn't even care. Best of luck, lads, because I know, as that man would know, just how much time, effort, dedication, funding takes to get it somewhere. Like, ten years, this is like six, seven years ago he did it. Do you know what I mean? And like... It's took me seven years to be a successful business, but I also took something else from that. I also took Gumball's noticed who I am. Fucking sweet. Okay, let's do it. And there's been somebody else that noticed who you were and anybody that um, has the ability to look on companies' house these days or see names and logos and uh, numbers and all the rest of it. Again, going back to the people that can read stuff at face value Bef and think Before we move on, let me, tell you, let me just tell you something else. So this happened to me again, right? So... The Cannonball Run Island. Okay, yeah. So you've got the Cannonball Run, the film, 1960s, Golden Sands production, Burt Reynolds, everyone knows it. Then you've got the Cannonball Run Ireland. Okay? They're only in Ireland. They started to branch out into UK and Europe after I went to Ireland. So after five years of business, I decided to take the Cannon Run to Ireland, but to take the British customers that I already had overseas to the Irish countryside, the roads, all of that. So... I'm very respectful until you go against me or until you try and cause me an issue for no reason. If there's an issue there that needs to be sorted, great, let's sit down and have a conversation. So I rang the owner of Cannonball Island and I said to him, hi, look, it's Jay from the Cannon Run. I'm sure, as you know, we're coming over. I'd love to come and see you and sit down with you just to clear the air because I'm not here to do probably what you think I'm here to do. So I went and sat with him. S foolishly as a kid, sat there and gave him all his inspiration and all his praises about his brand and what he'd achieved because in Ireland he's massive like a real big event, 200 cars, streets closed down, police escorts, like the same level as Gumball really, but in Ireland. So he went, tell you what, you're going to change your name. I was like, oh, sake, this dickhead. Like again, sweet. All right, so I've just praised you up and now you're going to sit there and talk to me like I'm 12. I said, all right, Mr. Bannon, what I'm going to do is, because his name Alan Bannon. So what I'm going to do is nothing. Because my surname's Cannon from birth, and that gives you the law of goodwill to use it in your business title. Whereas your surname's Bannon. So if you want to open a whole can of worms with me, I've got no issue sending a detailed email to Golden Sands Production in America about the use of the film name that you're actually ripping off word for word. And I stood up and walked out. So the two biggest brands in the industry have tried to, tried to in some way, shape or form, cross me, put me down, take me to court, however you want to dress it up. Do you think that is the nature of the industry that you're in? No. Well, it's the nature of the people that run their business, mate. Like, if I saw a 21-year-old lad now go and start the Shannon run, if they were from Shannon in Ireland, hypothetically speaking, I wouldn't be sending them a cease and desist letter. Ten years from now, I'm going to be 40. I ain't going to care. 
Like, let them get on with it, man. Best of luck to you. Like, I really hope it works. I really hope you've got the bollocks, the drive, the ambition, and then in turn, the funding that will come with it to grow that brand to a point where it is successful. Because let me tell you, for the first five years, you don't earn no money in this rally industry. And most people can't survive five years. Why do you think people want to do it then? To think they look at Jay Cannon with yeah. his McLaren 720S yeah. and the event store, the 458 they look, and the SVR. Like and... you said about running a business with all the background bills and all the problems that come with it and everything that they don't see. What they do is they go, oh, the Mega Run, he probably takes 100 cars at seven grand a car. Fucking hell, lads, that's 700 grand turnover that is in one event. They don't fucking realise that the profit margins aren't that big because the hotels, Monaco's a grand a night. The food's fucking 150 quid a head, 200 quid a like, There's staff insurance wages bills loads of it so people look at us and go wow he's got an SF90 he's got a McLaren he's got, about the SF90. Yeah, got loads of different cars kicking about but like he must be doing all this off the cannon run <laughs> no sorry lads I hate to tell you but if that's what you think you're absolutely brain dead let me tell you where it comes from the network that the cannon run now has we get multiple phone calls a week. Can you help this business? Can you buy this business? Do you want to buy this property? This car's for sale. I need to buy this car. I've got someone that wants this car this week. I've got this Rolex for sale. Would you like to buy this recovery truck? It's constant. It's constant. My phone rings 10, not even 10 times, 10 times every half an hour normally. Deals. Yeah. Do, this is what's for sale. Jay, can you find this for me? Jay, can you sell this for me? I'm flat out. The Canon Run is now a con basically a concierge service for all of its network because they trust us. Like, there's probably not one dealership that I couldn't walk into. If I walked into Amari's tomorrow or Carl Hartley's and said, just hypothetically, I'll have that 812 Carl. I'll take it. I'll pay you tomorrow. Is that all right? He'd go, yeah. Because I've been here 10 years and people know now that I'm not going like, to... Like, I remember people in, in the beginning saying, oh, all he's going to do is take everyone's money for the rally and then not put the rally on. Like, I've proven myself and proven myself and proven myself. I've adapted. I've overcome. I've pushed. And, yeah. Do you think then, because I think the mark of a good business is that the founder can die and the business can carry can on. Stay. Do you think the business would stay? Yes, 110%, yeah. I do, yeah. doesn't need Jay to be the Canon Run. The Canon Run is a group of friends driving across Europe that are on a very well-planned event with good concierge, good hospitality, good organisation and the Canon Run brand on the doors. Got my house. Bought a football club. Bought a football club. <laughs> Chorley FC. Chorley FC. Jay Cannon owns a football club, Chorley FC, and you've just bought a drinks company, Bay Drinks Group. How the hell are you managing to do all of that alongside the Cannon Run? Oh, mate, it's we're we're doing 12, 14 hour days at the minute, seven days a week between the two of us. It's been mental, but again, this is the Cannon Run Network. So James rang me and went, listen, I've had a phone call. We can buy Chorley Football Club now. I don't even understand what offside means. <laughs> Like, <laughs> genuinely, bro. I've never watched a game of football my entire life. Like, it's... I, I never even watched the fucking... What's it called? The World Cup when I was growing up. Like, weren't interested. Cars, 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 cars. Don't care about football. I'm now an avid football fan because, obviously, we bought the club. So... We, um, of course, this sounds like a mini Ryan Reynolds. And, um, it gets better. It gets better. We're on the way to Ryan Reynolds. So I'll tell you now. So we bought the club. We tidied up the club in terms of its debts, its outstanding balances with people and all that. It was ready to go into liquidation, really, to be honest. So we've got the grounds all sorted. It's a 5,000 capacity stadium, pub, restaurant on there and, you know, little uh, bars everywhere and fan zone and all that sort of stuff. So... Got it all tidied up, and one of my best clients and also a very close friend of mine now is Shane Lynch, who was Boyzone back in the day. And as everybody knows, if you don't know and you're aged 21 to 27, you've probably never heard of Boyzone, but if you're aged 30 to 50, you'll know exactly who they are. And they're probably the most uncontroversial band, the most unoffensive band, and the most respected boy band that was never tearaways or, you know, damaging to people's lives. They were fairly, the music was fairly. Easy. It's just a good band. Yeah, just a very good band and obviously a very respected band as well. So I said to Shane, look, would you have any interest in taking a percentage of the club for Boyzone and coming on board as the owners, the new owners, <clears throat> but as an extension of us? So he said, yeah, signed. Let's have a conversation. So we did, sat down. And if you go on Google yourself anytime, just type in Chorley Football Club. And we have been on every single major news platform in the UK and Europe in the last four days. We've been in the same video sentences on BBC Breakfast Club, Breakfast, what's it called here? 
BBC breakfast, breakfast. Yeah, BBC Breakfast. They said, Ryan Reynolds bought Wrexham. Now, boys' own are coming in with Chorley Football Club. It's like, it's going off big time. So we've got a production company um, filming with us from next week. Um, six hour, six episode documentary, which is either going to Netflix or BBC straight away. It's been confirmed. And they're looking for season two and season three. So we're going to be, we are currently sitting in second in our league with the game in hand. Um, we're going to Wembley. Are you into flipping football? Oh, that's mad. Wembley. I know we're going to Wembley. Um, and obviously this new documentary around the club will elevate everything in terms of sponsorship deals, the revenue coming in, ticket sales. So the final question with that in thought, why? If you if you got to the point where you were making your 11 grand, 458 SVR, yeah. you built your business, you built the brand, the Canon run was always the thing. Do you think it's just that thing inside an entrepreneur, someone that wants their business? Are you ever satisfied? No. I, I, no, no, that's wrong of me to say that. I, I'm very satisfied with my home life, my partner, the business that I've built that's the Canon run. But I would like to build more. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that I want to grow the Canon run to Gumball's level or, you know something along those lines however I do want to do more business I want to grow my business knowledge I didn't know anything about football now I know a lot about football and the way I looked at it was it's just another business you've got your exes you've got your incomings you've got your outgoings as long as you can get them right that's pretty much your basic business running isn't it so and then obviously as you mentioned Bay Drinks Group which Bay Drinks Group was actually went into liquidation and closed down and we bought the existing building and basically the contact book and the phone lines and the vans and the brewery that's on site. I now know how to brew beer. <laughs> like, my knowledge is growing. I'm learning lots and lots of stuff. And then you can have that beer as partnered with the Cannon Run and it all comes together. Chorley Football Club can have its own beer. Boys Own can have their own beer. I've got loads of plans for it. Like, we can be like an influential beer brand. So if you're a celebrity and you want to create your own beer, come to me, we'll create your own beer and we'll distribute it from the factory and it'll be delivered to wherever you tell us. There's 10 kegs got to go there, there's 20 kegs got to go there. We've done a deal with V Festival, whatever it is. So there's loads of things that go through my head that I try and link all of my businesses together somewhere. I try and cross them over. Like, Chorley's never had supercars there in its life. First home game, sorry, the first major game of the season when we was playing... Our rivals, which were Chester, I made sure there was at least five or six supercars parked at the ground. Because when Chester walked in, straight away they're like, oh, no fucking hell, it must be all the new owners that are here. We've heard about this. Charlie's been took over straight away. It starts nagging the other team out and stuff. There's ways and means of skinning a cat. Jay, today has been fascinating. Um, not what I expected at all. I'm glad. Actually, uh, really not what I expected at all. I, I really appreciate you coming on. I've and I look forward to carry up in the future. It really has been a pleasure. Thank you.